To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 19, The Marriage Deal. Genesis chapter 24 describes the little known story of how Isaac married Rivka. On the face of it, there's not much to it, but give it another look and you'll find countless gems that transport us to the lives of ancient nomadic people and their customs and day-to-day lives. Has old and bedridden Abraham sent his slave back to Abraham's homeland to fetch a wife for his dearest son Isaac. He makes the slave swear that no matter what, Isaac will not marry a local woman. And with the grace of Yahweh, a proper wife will be found. Lo and behold, the slave encounters Abraham's niece, twice removed, Rivka, and after marriage negotiations, a deal is brokered. The slave returns with Rivka, the second Hebrew matriarch, to marry Isaac. Mazal tov. Let's dive in. Hi, Owen. Hi, Gil. Okay, this is unexpectedly a very unique chapter. Yes, uh, we like to say, I like to say at the beginning of my uh, shtick, shouting from the text. <laughs> what? What is this, the text shouting at you? This is like screaming at me. Uh, look, 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 I'm uh, totally different than uh, the other stories. Uh, if you read it in Hebrew, it's much more apparent. It's not only that the language seems a little bit, quote unquote, modern, the storytelling Ooh. is much more detailed, human. It's like a journey uh, of a slave. It's, yeah. it's even, a, you know, it's not a highborn or yeah. a r- highly respected uh, person. Yeah, we had up to now only the, the big guys. Yeah, the big guys, the, the, the high strata. And it's seemingly a miracle-less, miracle-less uh, mm-hmm. story. There's no real like point <laughs> what's the point of that story yeah we'll, we'll get to the if point you read later. It, yeah if you read it uh, as without, a narrative yeah, as a narrative right. without context yeah. then you have like uh, amazing stories amazing miracles uh, yes. sulfur and fire over yes. a city yes. wars a father almost killing his son yeah and, and, he, then? and who speaks with god and then suddenly there's a, a very detailed uh, let's say even uh, colorful Yes. In terms of like all the other stories were like uh, black and white uh, films with a very minimalistic approach yes. to storytelling. Yes. Here is a little bit m- like a telenovela even uh, in terms of the uh, human emotions and yes. the human reactions. Yes. And uh, it's even the telenovela in writing, but in produc- production value, it's not a... Uh, the bold and the beautiful it's more like a dynasty and dallas uh, you know <laughs> it's second n- generation 2.0 yeah it's it's like a, a melodrama it's it's not even the, the you had the binding of isaac tremendous drama minimalistic drama few words to describe emotions and yes. feelings and, and, and action yes and here you have a melodrama it makes the text scream and shout <laughs> That, uh, that uh, ha- I am uh, an, an editing job. I'm a clear editing job. Added later. Added much in, later. Inserted between stories and lineages. We have in, uh, even the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have the receipts. We have the receipts. <laughs> we have the receipts. But first, let's, uh, like, why is this episode here? It, I don't think we mentioned it enough. This, this is a lineage-obsessed uh, people. Mm-hmm. Lineages on top of lineages in this very story. We want to make sure that you know that we didn't mix with the local people yeah. here. We went back to bring them from where Abraham came. Yeah. So it's the same, even the same family. The purity of the blood was kept. That's yes. the most important part. Yes. <laughs> probably of the entire Abraham stories. Because if we take what we said up until now, that Abraham is a familiar character that walks in this cultural, historical space, i.e. the Mesopotamian slash Egyptian yeah. empire. Uh, Levant, the Levant. whole thing. So it is highly important to connect your own lineage, your own people, your own blood to that familiar and well-known uh, character. Yes. That's why... The Different from all the hundreds of other peoples around. If we imagine that most of the stories that were told about Abraham Abraham was somewhat known 
either it was known that Abraham was the character in all those stories or it was really ra- the, the people who told that story yeah. over and over again yeah, told it guy. as Abraham. Yeah, it's yeah. our guy. It's our guy because he sent a slave to make sure that you people are a direct lineage by this specific line and blood. Yes. It's not tainted by other uh, mm. people mm. who, who came mm. from Abraham as well. The Is- Ismael came from Abraham. After this episode, it is uh, told that uh, he has another son and uh, yes. more people came from that yes. son. And if you continue reading, you will see that Isaac had the same more or less task. He gave that task to his son Jacob to go to... The same place. It's the same place uh, to the same family. Yes. The same guy, Lavan, is mentioned here yeah. in this story. And foreshadowing. Also. So it's kind of foreshadowing and it's kind of a prequel, you know, uh, added later prequel yes. to connect those stories, yes. as we said here in the episode many times. In the podcast. In the podcast. Uh, a story that is told many, many times in, I believe that in the mind of ancient uh, people in ancient history people it doesn't mean that the story is a cliche and thus a trope a storytelling trope it means the opposite if we hear the same story in different iterations it makes that story feel more true not less true and also actually this is also true for greek mythology they had all these versions for the same story and they had competitions and stuff which I- which will be like the 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 uh, the most widely accepted and appreciated version. But I think they had a conundrum here. Abraham, Abraham, he can't go back to fetch a wife for his son. No, because he was already told, Lech Lecha, go forth. Could have, uh, you know, inserted yeah. it uh, earlier, but it just, it goes against the whole basis of the narrative that he just, he's told, go, and he goes. Yeah. He can't go back. And his son uh, is too young, so he sends someone else. He sends uh, his uh, main slave, mm-hmm. main squeeze. There's so much we can learn. Do you want to say it now? You want to talk about it now about the customs, uh, the day-to-day customs of that time, or you want to first place it in the historical timeline, and then that's more relevant. The customs of that time. If you ask, uh, I believe, if you ask like a religious person who believes in the Jewish tradition, then. Abraham in the collective imagination lives circa 1800 BC. Yes. But there's <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the places that he's, he's visiting, and if you look, uh, for example, here, his slave is bringing lots of camels. The problem. It contradicts what we know from archaeological findings and whatever, and Fossils. carbon uh, dating and yeah. stuff like that. Two Israeli scholars date the appearance of camels Domesticated, domesticated camels. camels that were used specifically for a, te- a logistical task, basically. It's somewhat in 900 BCE, 900-1000 BCE, in the reign of uh, Shoshanek the first, Shoshanek the first, uh, an Egyptian emperor who his empire reached even the Levant. It's a well-known fact that there was a large copper industry here. So those two Israeli scholars date the domestication of camels to perform a specific carrying job, like a logistical carrying job, in the reign of Shoshnechnik the first, when there was a large uh, industry of copper, and you needed to, you needed uh, to uh, carry trade, trade okay. and uh, have trade routes. So the fact that Abraham here supposedly lived in 1800 BC, uh, it contradicts the fact that there were no camels back then yes. that had that that specific uh, task. Camels like. Uh, it is called bacteria camels were domesticated like 3000 BCE, but in a place far further from this Mesopotamian uh, space. And if you look at Abraham's journey mm. from the place of his birth to Egypt, basically, he, he came down even mm-hmm. to Egypt. Mm-hmm. It suspiciously <laughs> looks exactly like the Mesopotamian space from uh, Ur Kashdim, Ur, basically. Uh, near the Persian Gulf of the Chalids <laughs> <laughs> near the Persian Gulf yes. Gulf so you have the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean as a barrier so the Persian Gulf here is like the most uh, the eastern point uh, the lower uh, the southern eastern point and then he goes west northwest to Haran which is in northern northern Syria he goes south until Egypt and if you look at the map the, that map of his route 
and just to pose it <laughs> just to pose it juxtapose. juxtapose it over the map of uh, mesopotamia it's basically the same area yes. the sem- the the semitic people all the all the big civilizations that start here this is the cultural religious political space that yes. they're living in So the story is much we can see it's a later edition if we look at the language, but it's even more than that. It's a, it has like customs and, uh, and s- stuff that didn't even existed at the time that uh, Abraham uh, walked the earth. Also some more evidence that this is around 800 BCE ish. Yeah, something like that. Something like that is the also because of the geopolitical situation <coughs> and the names of the the places. So he goes to Aram Naharaim. Mm-hmm. Naharaim became Aramaic only after the Bronze Age collapse. Aram Naharaim uh, wa- wasn't Aram Naharaim uh, before that. Yet. Aram, Aramit, Aramaic. Naharaim, it's nice. It's, uh, it's like a uh, Nahar, Nahar river. So yeah. it's like rivers, two rivers, yeah. but just like in one, in one word. So scholars think that it was like the northern mm. uh, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia yeah. between the rivers. Yeah. But the Aramaic, because the Aramaics, they added uh, their Aram to all those places that uh, they control. We will talk about the Aramaic. They will uh, appear uh, a lot <laughs> in, the, mm-hmm. in this ancient history. Stay tuned. Even though it's not 1800 yeah, of course. Before BCE, it's 900, let's say. <laughs> it's still interesting to get a glimpse into their wow. day-to-day lives wow. and traditions. For example, the slave swears by putting his hand <laughs> beneath his thigh. That's Abraham's thigh. Yeah. This is really interesting. Yeah. Like they do it twice. This is like the ceremony of the swearing yeah. of the oath. Yeah. You put your hand under the person's thigh. thigh. That's kind of weird. <laughs> It's weird. <laughs> But they, they have I try to get into their, into their heads and, and, and try to imagine why they do that. And I have no idea. <laughs> I think maybe because of the, intim- of the intimacy. You put your hand under somebody's thigh. It's like an intimate... Hmm. Like, you're, like he's vulnerable. Yeah. You're close to his genitals. Yeah, maybe it's the closest... You can get to the gent- genitals without it being too awkward or <laughs> sexual. <laughs> I can't think of any other uh, reason. Just like I can't just imagine he puts his ha- the, his hand under his, his lord's thigh. Just you can whatever. Think about medieval times. You have a lord, and the way that he makes you swear something is that you touch him in an intimate, non-sexual place. Then you Or, really yeah. are bound to this oath. Now that I think of it, if I imagine the scene of a person putting his hand underneath <laughs> another person's another thigh. Man, another man's another thigh. Man's <laughs> <laughs> the person with the hand, as you said, is highly, highly vulnerable. He can get killed in an instant. Also the person with the thigh. He's touching you near But your penis. Y- y- the thigh is locking the hand down. Ah, two thighs locking. Like yeah, hold, so okay, you, you, imagine hold, it? Okay. you have like a thigh, a thigh hold. <laughs> <laughs> a thigh hold and then you're completely vulnerable. You can, I can stab you in the throat. Yes, you have one, uh, one, yeah, you have uh, only one arm, arm tied. Yeah. Okay. I, I was thinking the other way. That the, ver- the, the vulnerable person here is the Lord. And like your Lord, not mm. the V Lord. And he tells you like, okay, now I let mm. you do this. Now you really owe me uh, because you touched my, mm. the, under, the underneath of my thigh. Mm. Okay. so this Or is I didn't kill you when I had the chance. Uh, you can uh, count on me. Whatever. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you can uh, have your own ideas, but this is very, very interesting. And foreign to us completely. No, like, you know, having like blood on you, like a blood handshake or putting your sword like uh, at the feet of yeah. the Lord and all kinds bowing. of gestures, bowing, yeah. all kinds of gestures that we know. This is a totally different gesture put in twice here. So it must be important. Yeah. It's like the, the covenant of the pieces thing. Like, oh, it's this a is cultural the yeah, signifier. Exactly. Yeah. Like the people listening to the story. They say, oh, he did that, Richard. Yeah. To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms.